And here are some of the stories we are covering. The World Bank projects slow economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa in 2023. African countries need to really, really put all the effort to stabilize the economies. There's a real risk now that we might face an economic crisis that is going to be related to debt. U.S. officials reaffirm Washington's commitment to Africa's development in the financial technology sector. The U.N. says its mission in Mali remains essential for stability and security. Tunisian police clear a UNHCR camp with violence and tear gas. Malawi's president bemoans Cyclone Freddy's impact on the economy and livelihoods. This devastating climate change event has killed over 1,000 people, displaced over half a million, and affected over 2 million through the washing away of homes, roads, businesses, and power lines. And a former Uganda government minister is denied bail for insufficient guarantors. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. The World Bank says economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa will slow from 3.6% to 3.1% in 2023. In a report released ahead of this week's spring meetings of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the World Bank in Washington, D.C., the World Bank says the projection is brought on by uncertainty in the global economy, a sharp decline in investments, and rising debt levels. Andrew Dabalin is the World Bank's chief economist for Africa. He tells me that African governments must sharpen their macroeconomic stability, domestic revenue collection, and debt reduction to reduce extreme poverty and boost prosperity in the medium to long term. So let's say um, Africa is a patient and they came in six months ago for a checkup, and now this is a follow-up. Okay, so in this follow-up, what we are saying is that the conditions for economic activity remain sluggish. Uh, we project growth to decline from about 3.6 to 3.1 percent, and that is primarily because of the underperformance of some of the big economies in the region, like South Africa, Nigeria, Angola. What are some of the factors responsible for the picture you've, you've just uh, painted? Uh, a few things really stand out. One is African countries depend a lot on trade, trading in you know few commodities, minerals, uh, agricultural goods. So the weak global demand is a major reason why growth is being dragged down. Investment underperformance is another one. Inflation has peaked, but it remains very high. And you know when inflation is very high, you know consumption is lowered, investments are lower, and so economic activity in general gets dragged down. Then there is this really, really high interest rates that are happening in uh, rich countries that are spilling over into what African countries can do. And then finally, there's a lot of high debt, which uh, basically takes away the ability to borrow domestically to finance core development issues. How can Africa get out of this debt distress or trap other than an outright debt forgiveness? Certainly, you know, debt restructuring for some countries is going to be an option. But short of that, what other things can African countries do? One thing they can do is, of course, to rationalize how they spend, what they control, right? So domestic resources that they control. The other thing they can do is, of course, is to really focus on growth, because once you grow, you're going to be able to actually have more businesses come into the into the economy and they can generate more revenues for you. Earlier this week, I read a news article uh, in which a Chinese government official called on the United States to make a greater effort to address Africa's debt crisis. A number of African countries have uh, begun borrowing from China. What is the difference between a Chinese government loan and, uh, say, for example, the IMF or World Bank loan? So I don't have details of how the Chinese loans are made. But what I can tell you is I can tell you about some of the ways in which the World Bank and IMF types of loans are made. And in some ways, that may give you some point about ways in which this could be uh, different. So in our case, what we usually do is for very, very poor countries, we give them grants. So they don't have to repay them, especially countries that are in very high debt distress and are poor. Second, a lot of our loans, especially for low income countries, are concessional. What usually that means for your audience is that these are loans that are taken for something like you don't have to repay them for 30, 40, maybe sometimes you know, 50 years. 
and very low interest rates. How can Africa fight back to deal with its current economic challenges? After all, the continent is still rich in resources. How can it fight back? Exactly. So several ways Africa can actually try to get out of this. I'm going to recommend some things that sound very standard recommendations, but actually they are really the right recommendations. One is African countries need to really, really put all the effort to stabilize the economies. There's a real risk now that we might face an economic crisis that is going to be related to debt. The second thing African countries can do is to do a lot more in, be very aggressive in the way they reform the economies, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, how to increase productivity of the agricultural sector, how to in- increase the inflow of private investments, because, you know, government revenues are going to be challenged uh, in this environment when borrowing costs are high. So it's important to bring in a lot more private investment for jobs, for poverty reduction. And then finally, it's really, really important for Africans to invest in a third engine of growth. One engine of growth has been this global uh, trade, which now looks very weak and uncertain and potentially fragmented. Another one has been the domestic market. But now we have this continental free trade. So that should be the third engine of growth that becomes really, really powerful as a blueprint for development for the region. Thank you so much. A pleasure speaking with you. Well appreciated. Thank you so much, James. That's Andrew Dabalin, World Bank Chief Economist for Africa. You're speaking with us from Washington, D.C., where the spring meetings of the IMF World Bank are taking place. U.S. officials on Wednesday reaffirmed Washington's commitment to partnering with Africa in the continent's development, especially in the financial technology sector, the continent's fastest-growing industry. Viewers Mike Hovey attended the 2023 Africa FinTech Summit, which brought together delegates from over 50 nations, many of them from Africa. He spoke to Rami Tulu, the Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, about U.S. U.S. investments in Africa. Uh, at the Africa Leaders, U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in December, uh, President Biden emphasized the importance that the U.S. attaches to a partnership with Africa to unlock the enormous potential on the continent. Um, and one component of that is the digital economy. Uh, we've learned around the world that digital connectivity unleashes extraordinary economic potential. And uh, through a new initiative, uh, Digital Transformation in Africa initiative, uh, the U.S. government is seeking to partner with uh, African countries, the private sector, uh, and uh, small businesses to try to expand connectivity in Africa uh, and expand the use of digital tools uh, to unleash this economic potential. Why choose to support Africa? U.S. has strong connections to Africa through diaspora that are in the United States. Um, Africa has, uh, you know, historically had problems of food insecurity, uh, ha- continues to, to face, have the need for economic development. And so the U.S. wants to be a partner in, uh, in unlocking some of that potential to raise living standards, to provide more economic opportunity, uh, to strengthen food security. And the digital transformation can be a part of uh, realizing all of these objectives. Now, to go back to, I guess, infrastructure, the development of Africa, um, those are some of the challenges that the continent is facing. And, of course, the U.S. is investing in that. Uh, Could you tell us more about how that would improve the continent's fintech sector? Sure. Basically, lots of economic activity depends upon connections. So traditional economic activity, connections through roads. You need to be able to get goods to market. The uh, partnership that the U.S. has with Africa on physical infrastructure is intended to address that component. Mm -hmm. Um, But with the modern uh, economy, that digital connectivity and digital infrastructure is also incredibly important. And so uh, what we're looking to do is partner with African countries not only to get that physical infrastructure uh, that's necessary for the digital economy, but also to connect entrepreneurs with one another, can connect those entrepreneurs with financing so that we can upscale various important uh, financial innovations, including in the fintech sector, to benefit all Africans. I really want to delve a little into the DTI itself. Um, how can young entrepreneurs in the fintech industry from the continent tap into that? Well, one way is through events like the Fintech Summit. And when 
uh, we ha hosted the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, we also had an innovators gathering. The, what we call the convening power of the U.S. government is an opportunity to bring together these young entrepreneurs uh, and have them meet representatives from Google, representatives from MasterCard, who are also in, in attendance at events uh, like this today. Another mechanism is through various programs that the U.S. government has to catalyze private investment. So our